Hello everyone, this is your CAD tutor and today we're gonna go over engineering drawings. So the first thing you do, you can go about it different ways. You can create a brand new drawing from scratch and with that, assume you don't have an assembly open, you go to file, new, uh, and then you have part assembly of drawings, so we're gonna select drawing. This is how it works 2016, but it's the same for 2018 and all the way through 2020. I have used uh, even the most current one, most current version of 2020, and it's still the same for the most part. So we're gonna go ahead and select drawing, okay. Right off the bat, unless you already have your company or at home, if you already have a, a sheet format already pre-established, pre-defined, you would have you would never see the screen. Uh, however, if you have multiple different sheet formats that, formats that you need to work on, uh, you'll get this window. Uh, also, if you work for a company, you usually will have the options to select your sheet size. So I'm going to select the size B. That's uh, 11 by 17, like I mentioned. So I'm just going to hit OK. I'm not going to select anything here just yet. I'm just going to closes out. <clears throat> so by default it gives you the title block. At the bottom right you get this series of cells fields which is called the title block in an engineering drawing. Typically it has the name or the the signature and the date of those involved in the drawing such as the, the drafter, the engineer, um, quality assurance, manufacturers, etc. etc. Uh, all the various approvers that you may have. And additionally to that, you get some standard tolerances. Uh, if you don't want to add a specific tolerance to your component, to your dimension, or any given feature on the drawing, it'll default back to this title block. In this case, uh, you may have anything that is three decimal points so will be plus or minus 0 0.005. Anything that's you know, two decimal points will be 0 0.010 or something, or 0 0.01. Again, depending on your application, depending on the feature and how critical it is to the functionality of your design. And on this end, on, to the right side, you'll see that the title is and the drawing number is usually the the what gets your attention the bit the most. Uh, for the title, you know, it's whatever you want to call this particular drawing. Usually, the name of the component. The drawing number that will depend whether you're numbering your component if at your company you're assigning a part number for each one of your your components then it would go here and the revision the revision is really important either numerical or alphabetical the revision tells you what is the most recent version of that of that component you know usually you want to be using the most up-to-date the most recent revision uh, size that's B size and the scale Scale one to one, meaning that a part, if you actually print it on a size B piece of paper, so an 11 by 17 inches, uh, that part will be its actual size. That if you were to lay, lay over whatever device on top of that box, on top of that printed cover, it would be the actual size and overall dimensions. So, you know, for the uh, the sheet formatting, I'm going to go and start placing our components. I'll select model view. It already has this open, the electronic box. However, I don't want to select the entire box. I just want to select one component. I'll select the lid of that component. I'll go ahead and open up my browser and I'll find the lid. Here it is. Click it twice. So now automatically it shows the preview of what it's going to look like once you place it on. Here it's showing the front side of it. So the front, I think we selected it to be the front of the electronic box. So this would be the side of the lid. So I don't want the front, I want the top of it. So if I just click on the top, now you can see the envelope is now a little larger given that we're looking at the lid top down. At this point, you could select the, the scale that you want. If I do one to one, you see that it's much larger, so it makes sense that uh, this is why I chose size B of a sheet. And now you can just click on the actual sheet and it'll place it on. So automatically, it allows me to create the projection, to so projected views of this. So again, using third, third, third angle projection, it allows me to place either the top 
or the right view or the left view or the bottom view whichever you select it'll pick the correct view so in this case third angle view means if I place this view on the to the right side of this first view of this top view it will be looking at the part from the right side from the right hand side so I'll do that for most parts you need at least three three views uh, in this case you don't necessarily need three views because there is nothing on that third view that we need we already have the thickness with this view right here we have the thickness of the overall material I don't have any special features on either one of these faces I don't have anything on this face that is not already covered by this one so we'll leave it at that at this point I can click on the checkbox oh one thing we do want to add and it just reminded me because I, as I was going at an angle it shows you an isometric view isometric view is really important to give you kind of an understanding of what it's going to look like from an isometric uh, point of view so I'll click on that now because it's isometric you'll never lay over any component on that view because it is at an angle so because of that because of that reason you can make this scale much smaller so we'll change the scale I don't want to use parent scale I'll use a custom scale here on the left side so I'll make this I'll make this a little smaller I'll make it one by two one thing I want to point out is that <clears throat> right off the bat this view came with these center lines with these uh, center points for each of my countersink holes this is useful when you have uh, holes of different sizes on the same face because by just by looking at a hole you can't really tell its size however if there's 10 different holes and only five of them are of a specific size and the rest are a different size then you may want to use that it's called center mark here on the top so you can add it you can do that and automatically click on whatever holes you want and then that helps associate those holes together as being part of the same size in this case they're all exactly the same size so I'm not going to bother too much with it so the first thing you need to do when you're dimensioning any component is to dimension the overall dimensions so the main envelope of the part itself in this case uh, for this view is the width and the, the height of it and then the last one will be the thickness so you go to the smart dimension option and then typically it's it's even though we're we're selecting we're going to be dimensioning this width this overall width here I think it's it's a better approach to select the opposing faces uh, and the reason I do that is because when you're selecting this side over here it is literally dimensioning this face this line right here it's not dimensioning from this left line or this left surface to this right surface it's just dimensioning this edge at the bottom so if for whatever reason we were to change this edge uh, say we were to add a feature or I don't know um, half arcs on here it's no longer going to be a, an entire face and so that dimension may be lost and I'll, I'll sketch really quickly kind of what I'm talking about say for instance we were to add a feature like this that's kind of a bite and then this this portion here from that segment is no longer there it's a surface and then there's a curve and then the surface continues if I had selected the smart dimension to be on that surface and not on the opposing surfaces then that dimension later on may be lost and you may come back to the drawing after you open the part you may come back to the drawing to find yourself that you have lost the dimension so again best practice to just do opposing faces that way you know that you're doing what you your intention is to measure the overall dimension from one surface from one side to the opposing side so you select one line and then you select the opposite line and then SolidWorks automatically allows you to select where to place it above it or below it this way it will never interfere with other dimensions I'll place it on top 
given that I have the title block on the bottom. And now I'll do the other side. So now I'm doing opposing faces top and bottom to give me my left side or uh, width. So now that we have left to right and top to bottom, so we have two of the three overall dimensions that we need. Lastly, we need is the thickness of the material. Again, this is important for uh, the tool makers or the machinists who are going to be uh, making this component. And it's important for them to understand whether this thickness is a standard thickness of material they can buy from you know stock, and if so, usually they come in in round numbers like this, you know, half inch, quarter inch, an inch, and so on, and even in fractures in between, such as an eighth of an inch, and so on. And so it's really important to not only state that here, but once you state the thickness, it's also really important to say whether this thickness is really crucial for your for your assembly. In this case, this is just a lid, so I don't necessarily need this this uh, quarter of an inch to be too precise. I don't need it to be down to you know five tenths of, of an inch or or even five thousandths of an inch. So uh, I will leave it at at this at 0.25. I'm not going to add any more decimal points. And as a matter of fact, I can add a note. So if you click on the on the dimension, you can add notes here on the dimension text box. So whether it's next to it or below it, I'm going to choose below. You can just type in STK and they'll know it's stock, meaning that whatever dimensions that stock material comes in typically is is okay with you. You don't need to add any more than that. And this definitely helps out in manufacturing because they don't this way they don't have to get a thicker material if if it comes slightly undersized or slightly oversized then they would have to perform some sort of operations if it's undersized obviously they can't use it if it's oversized they would have to face this this entire surface here or the or the bottom or both in some cases if you are requiring other things such as uh, how flat you want those surfaces to be Okay, so now the next thing that I would like to do is to mention the internal features right here. I have uh, eight holes. And so because all the holes are the same size, all I need to do is dimension one and add the quantity to it. So I'll pick this top left. You could select that and edit it, or you have other options and simply call it out yourself. You could, instead of having this diameter here, you can delete that. And then, and then just say, make sure that when you're editing or adding any text is all in capital letters. You don't want to use any lower cases on here. So you'll say size for counter sink. There are no other holes on this on this face on this view. So automatically, you know that the eight times the eight instances that you're referring to is the ones that are on this view. Now this, I could say that is a lazy way of doing it. Now this could be accepted by some machine shops, but it may not be, it may not be accepted by all of them. Given that it's not per the ASME Y14.5 standards. Uh, so if you're using standards, uh, forward engineering drawings this may not be the best way of doing it so you'll have to delete that so counter sink holes the way you define them is that by first adding the inner diameter so you add a diameter symbol that's down here so you add the diameter symbol and then the inner diameter for this one I believe it was 0.125 then you're going to add the depth of that inner diameter in this case we're going to drill a hole through the entire part so you can just type in the word through abbreviate it this way however if there was some depth specified to it if it was a blind hole and not a through hole then you would add the depth symbol and the depth symbol is down here this is arrow pointing down and then you would say 0.25 if that's the case Again, I'm not going to do that because it's a through hole, so this simplifies things. 
So on the second line, you're going to add the countersink sizes or the this countersink dimensions, if you will. And the two countersink dimensions that it, that you will need to to annotate here are the the size of the diameter that the countersink starts at the very top, and the angle at which is going to be cut. So, but before we do that, we need to define whether it's a countersink or or a counter bore. So this is not for a socket head screw. This is for a flat a flat head screw. So we're going to use this countersink symbol. That immediately tells whoever is looking at the drawing that the, the dimensions following that are going to be for a countersink hole. And the diameter, I believe, was 0.25 or 0.24, something like that. And the angle. So we do this. The angle typically for screws is either 100 degrees or 82 degrees. I'm going to select 82, the degree symbol down here. And that is essentially it. Another way you can do this is by going to the whole callout button directly up to the top in the annotations tab. So you click on it and then you click on the hole that you are wanting to call out. So as you can see, it also detected the angle by itself because it was part of the library of holes that we used here when we first defined it. And that's one very useful uh, feature to use if you're going to be using holes or a certain size. It's always good to do that, to pick from the library that is specified already that's part of, of SolidWorks. And if you were to change this from, say, a normal to a close fit, that means that the diameter, the through hole diameter would change. And if you go back to your drawing, it would automatically change to, to that specific diameter. Again, it's, uh, if you, in this case, if you leave three decimal points, it, it'll it default to whatever tolerances you have at the bottom right. Uh, again, you get to define that or whatever company you work for may already have defined that on the sheet format. I like to leave it with three decimal points because if you look at, at most uh, whole size charts for screws, for machine screws, you will usually see three numbers, three decimal points. And so this can tell the, the tool maker or the machinist right off the bat that you want a loose fit. Uh, so that is how you dimension these holes. Now, the last thing that we're gonna do that I'm going to go over in this video is going to be the location of these holes. So location of the holes is probably the most important part of dimensioning your your part, your component. And that is because these holes, these clearance holes here, will have to mate, will have to align with the holes on the bottom sides of the assembly. So if we recall, this lid goes on on top of this electronic box and so they have to match with these holes here. These are tabbed holes. If they don't match, then you will not be able to properly uh, close this this lid. And so one way of ensuring you do that is ensuring that the dis distance between the holes is consistent. Uh, oftentimes, uh, beginners dimension a hole or other features not just holes but all their crucial aligning features from the edges and although that could be the case that could be the how you wanted to do it it's often not the best practice because edges are not always crucial during your assembly in this case it is definitely not crucial I don't really care about the edges I guess I, I would care if it's if it is grossly oversized but if it's somewhat oversized it wouldn't really affect the operation it would it would affect uh, the cosmetics of it, the looks of it, sure, the aesthetics, but the actual functionality, it would not because I did not do that. So what you're going to do is you're going to dimension the holes, the holes location with each other. So you're going to respective to each other. So you're going to select a hole and you're going to start dimensioning them like this. This way, I know for a fact that if there is a tolerance, it'll be between each hole like this. So now I have the distance between these two holes. And since 
but the distance between these two holes and these two down here are the same, I can add a quantity to my dimension here. So we do as usual to x. Same for this. There's a you have a distance from here to here, and then you also have this one down here. The next step to it is adding the next dimension. So a way of understanding this is now you're you're defining the distance between this hole and this hole to be 1.75. However, the moment you add another dimension like I did here, 1.75, now you're saying that the distance between this hole and this hole is 1.75. However, although in a perfect world the distance from here to here is three and a half inches because I dimensioned them separately like this from two separate features now there could be an added tolerance that may be undesirable what does that mean uh, if I have a plus or minus tolerance of 0.01 for any dimensions with two decimal points now I have a plus or minus one between here and here and I have an additional plus or minus one from here to here. So the overall tolerance from this top hole to this bottom hole could be plus or minus two. And at that point, the holes may no longer align with the threaded holes, with the tapped holes on the bottom electronic box. So that is, I believe it's called chain dimensioning, and that's something that you want to avoid. Uh, and again, you're stacking up more and more tolerances. So in order to avoid doing that, you select this dimension, delete it. In order to avoid doing that is you select the same original hole that you picked for the first dimension and you dimension from there. So you dimension from here like we did all the way here. And so now this 3.5. Now the 3.5 is plus or minus 0 0.01. So it doesn't matter where this middle hole lands, it could be plus 0.01 or minus 0.01. It will not affect that second hole because this hole does not care where this middle hole is. It only cares where the initial one is. So same thing for the top. And same thing goes for any other dimensions that are crucial. And now we have our, de our defined holes. So all the holes have now been defined in a way that if one moves, they will all be moving with respect to that initial hole. Uh, another way of doing this, if you have 20 holes or even 10 holes, you would have, you would see that this starts looking not the prettiest. It would start going out to the left, start eating into my drawing. And I don't wanna use a brand new sheet just for that just to add all the dimensions. And so what I do, leave the leave the overall dimensions the way they are. Uh, but what you can do is, if you go to the Smart Dimension option on the top left here, you click on the arrow, and then you can click on, in this case, vertical, since we're going from the top down. It's essentially the same thing, except you pick the first number, your first uh, hole or feature, and then from there you pick all the rest. What it essentially does is it picks this feature, this first hole, as the origin for all the other dimensions. So I can do the same for this portion over here. In this case, I'll pick horizontal ordinate dimension. And either way works. Uh, if you don't have too many repeated features, uh, go in with baseline dimension is uh is still a clean way of doing it however if you have too many to the point where you're cluttering your drawing uh, going with ordinate dimension is the way to go so at this point my drawing is pretty much fully dimensioned uh, there's other things you could add you could add center lines if you have symmetric components so if you go to the top there we have the center line button here and then you select the Opposing edges again and it'll create a, a center line however if you want to specify some more you can add a note 
uh, you can tell where you want this node to go and then here you have options right here you have the center line add symbol center line and you can add the same symbol at the bottom so that way you know that whatever happens to this side will happen to this side and vice versa top to bottom so now you have it uh, before you finalize make sure that everything is correct make sure your views are correct this one uh, one thing we forgot to add was a scale or we changed the scale to be one to two and so we're gonna add a node to this isometric view so you can call it iso view and then you can say scale one to two center align just keep it nice and symmetric and you move this to the top try to make it as clear as possible but at this point we're we're pretty much done so again this covers the basics of engineering drawings again these are the very very basics we're not even scratching the surface but i wanted to at least have something to show how to start using best practices not just when designing but also when creating your engineering drawing so thank you again for your time and uh, don't forget to like this video if you wanted to see some more and don't forget to hit that subscribe button thank you